So, okay, so about two months ago, I made these videos. Um, I did it because I was trying to articulate my concerns. Um, now, what happened as a consequence of making these videos was, um, was really quite unexpected to me. There's been 140 print articles published about this, um, whatever this is, in the last two months, and then dozens and dozens of, of YouTube videos and television interviews and radio interviews and demonstrations. Millions of people have been tuning into this online. And so obviously something's up, and I can tell you that what's up isn't only a discussion about Bill C-16 and about gendered pronouns. You know, sometimes when you're having a debate or a discussion with someone that you love and you're having a, a little argument about something, like who's going to do the dishes or something like that, or especially if you haven't been getting along very well with that person, you know how the discussion starts with something specific and then you start trading all the things that it might be about until you're arguing about, you know, the way that you behaved on your third date, you know, 10 years ago, and the whole underlying unresolved chaos of your relationship emerges through the little portal that was defined by the argument. You know, well, that's what this is about. So what, what the hell's going on here exactly? And why are, are we damn near at each other's throats? Look at what happened in, in the United States a week and a half ago. There's some things to talk about here, and I started to try to talk about them, and I would say that my freedom to do so was rapidly infringed upon. My career was put at risk, and, and I find this absolutely unacceptable because I am trying to sort this out. And so we need to start talking and listening. And when you talk, it doesn't mean you're right, it doesn't mean you're correct, right? It means you're trying to articulate and formulate your thoughts like the boneheaded moron that you are. And you're going to stumble around idi idiotically because what the hell do you know? You're full of biases and you're ignorant and you can't speak very well and you're over emotional. And you know, you've got just problems that you can hardly even imagine that are interfering with your ability to state something clear. And so what you do is you do your best to say what you mean and then you listen to other people tell you why you're a blithering idiot. And hopefully you can correct yourself to some degree as a consequence of listening to them. And you see, that's what free speech is about. It isn't just that people can can organize themselves and their societies by thinking. You can't do that because there's only one of you. What you have to do is you have to articulate your thoughts in a public forum so that other people can attack you, and hopefully in a corrective manner. And then you want to, you know, step back a little bit and think, okay, well, you know, I was a little arrogant there, and I was a little over-emotional there, and I didn't get that quite right, and maybe I'm outright biased on that front. And you, you want to correct what you say because then you correct how you are, and then you correct how you act in life, and then you correct your society. And, and to the degree that we limit free freedom of expression, we put all of that at risk. And that's partly why I don't believe that freedom of speech is just another value. I think that's preposterous. I think that if you claim that, then you know nothing about Western civilization and history. Is freedom of speech is not just another principle. It's the mechanism by which we keep our psyches and our societies organized, and we have to be unbelievably careful about in infringing upon that because we're infringing upon the process by which we keep chaos and order balanced. Well, what is this all about? I can list you some of the things that it's about. It's about inclusion versus bigotry and prejudice, right? It's about the left wing versus the right wing. It's about who's free to choose their language and what, what, what elements of respect that you're due to people who are different than you, say, with regards to pronoun use or chosen names. It's about whether the subjective or the objective is going to take precedence, because implicit in Bill C-16, and I'm telling you, there is an assault on the idea of objectivity itself, an assault on the idea of biology itself. And if the university thinks that the sciences are going to be immune from the ideological doctrine that's embedded in these, in these pieces of legislation, they better think again, because there, there is trouble coming. I know that Oise already has an anti-psychiatry program, and we noticed that Ken Zucker got hounded out of his job just a few years ago, even though he was an entirely credible scientist and clinician. It's about constructionism, social constructionism, versus positivism, versus pra pragmatism. And there's, there's a mother versus father thing going on here, too. And, you know, you kind of saw that with Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump. I would say that was the overproductive, devouring mother versus the tyrannical father, which is not a good... That's not a good narrative from a mythological perspective. It's about also the adversarial spirit, I would say, versus the Logos. And the adversarial spirit is the spirit that claims what I think right now is correct above all else and I have nothing whatsoever to learn versus the Logos. And the Logos is a very complex uh, idea. And that's that the proper citizen is the person who 
embodies truth in speech and attempts to act it out. And that also includes listening, because listening is part of communicative intent. And I think at the moment that we're, em we're embroiled in a war on every single one of those dimensions and several others that I haven't had time to list. And the, the evidence that we're in that sort of war is precisely the fact that this has attracted so much attention. I mean, I just sat in my bloody office at home and threw up a couple of amateurish videos, more or less attempting to articulate my feelings about a couple of policies, and it's like all hell broke loose. And why? Well, because that hell is right underneath the surface. I hate to stop there, but you're at the end of your time. I'm done. There have been some profound misunderstandings um, circulating about the law, and I'm here today as a lawyer, as a law professor, as a civil libertarian, as an expert in equality rights and freedom of expression to try to correct those misunderstandings. So let's start with Bill C-16, which passed third reading yesterday in the House. It's the proposed federal legislation that does three things. First, it adds gender identity and expression to the Canadian Human Rights Code. Ontario has had these since 2002. The federal government here is simply playing catch-up. Um, there is absolutely nothing unprecedented in this. Number two, Bill C-16 adds gender identity and gender expression to provisions in the criminal code that define an identifiable group for the purposes of advocating genocide, the public incitement of hatred, and the willful promotion of hatred. The Supreme Court of Canada has said there's a, very clear, there's a very clear definition. The threshold is violence. In fact, there has to be personal violence. It is an extremely high threshold. The court has said over and over again, and I quote, it is, quote, the unusually strong and deep felt emotions of vilification and detestation. The court has said it is not disdain, it is not dislike, it is not offense. Plus, something that's often lost, hate speech, criminal charges cannot be laid without the approval of the Attorney General. Third, Bill C-16 adds gender identity and expression to the provisions of the criminal code that deal with sentencing for hate crimes. So now, evidence of hatred on the basis of gender identity and expression could be taken into account. This has no impact on pronouns, unless, of course, an accused was misusing pronouns while assaulting, sexually assaulting, or murdering someone. Now let's look at the Ontario Human Rights Code. It's not constitutional law, which limits government action. It's not criminal law, where the state prosecutes individuals and sends them to jail. It's a type of civil law where private individuals can sue one another. Um, and the, the remedy is generally damages. Since 2012, the Ontario Human Rights Code has prohibited discrimination and harassment on the basis of gender identity and expression. It prevents discrimination and harassment against trans and gender non-binary individuals in employment, housing, and services. So what does this require in relation to pronouns? According to the Ontario Human Rights Commission's policy, section 7.4, it specifically said that refusing to refer to a person by their self-identified name or proper pronoun could constitute gender-based harassment. Refusing to refer to a trans person by their chosen name and a personal pronoun that matches their gender identity or purposely misgendering will likely be discrimination when it takes place in a social arena covered by the code, including employment, housing, services, like education. What about gender-neutral pronouns? Well, the commission has said, the Ontario Human Rights Code does not require any particular gender-neutral pronoun. If in doubt, ask the person how they wish to be addressed. Use they if you don't know, or simply use their chosen name. Is this the first time that a law has decided what we must say as opposed to what we cannot say? No, not at all, not even close. It's not uncommon for the law to require expression. Bilingual labeling requirements on food packaging, health warnings on cigarette packages, the oath of allegiance to the queen that must be sworn at citizenship, ceremonies. Does the requirement to not misgender the pronouns violate freedom of expression under Section 2B of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms? Probably it does. The Supreme Court of Canada says any restriction on speech is a prima facie violation of Section 2B. There's this whole other section in the Charter called Section 1, which says that all rights and freedoms are subject to reasonable limits as are demonstrably justifiable in a free and democratic society. 
why it all matters is um, because people matter. And I worry that we've moved into a place now, a kind of not only a post-truth politics, but a kind of post-empathy politics. How bloody hard is it to simply treat these people with respect and dignity? Because all this is about, all human rights are about, is respect and dignity. And if you could throw in a little kindness on the top, that would be even better. So I'm going to read you something that a graduate student sent me from the University of Toronto the other day, and I, I can also tell you that I've received hundreds of letters like this. Today, I had a tutorial at the University of Toronto where I talked about Jordan Peterson and issues of personal identity, legally sanctioned identity categories, etc. I brought up a video of a tall white man in his 30s who asked students at a university how they'd react if he told them he identified as a woman as black, as short, and as five years old. Spoiler alert. Students in the video resist some of the later categories a bit, but are mostly accepting. Still, students were not engaging in discussion. I asked them why. One said it was because she was worried to share her opinion for fear of being singled out or saying something offensive. I asked who else was not speaking for that reason. The whole class put their hands up. No participation. Why? They weren't uninterested. They were afraid to speak their minds. The PC police are in your heads. You just heard a lawyer's opinion. I have many lawyer's opinions, by the way. I'll start with lawyer one, who was the counsel to several prime ministers. He talked to me about the Human Rights Tribunal because I went and saw him two weeks after this all started. Human Rights Tribunal is a kangaroo court, in my opinion, and it should be abolished as fast as possible. It's one of the many institutions in Canada that pose a threat to your, to your freedom that, that is of almost unimaginable proportions. Here's what this top lawyer told me. If I'm taken in front of the Human Rights Tribunal, it will cost me $250,000. I will pay the legal costs for my opponents, and I will lose. He said, go back to your safe little life and shut your mouth. Second lawyer told me, my critique of the Ontario Human Rights Commission is spot on. And absent the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which has these contradictions built into it that you just heard described, much of what I was saying was illegal and has been illegal since 2012. Lawyer three told me that if I breached a tribunal order, so imagine I was taken in front of the Human Rights Tribunal and I was fined and then I refused to pay the fine, which I've stated that I would do. That equals contempt of court, which inevitably means jail until the contempt is purged. The social justice tribunals and the SJWs, social justice warriors who staff them, have a rogue nature. They can search your house without a warrant. They can use secret hearings. There are no rules of evidence and the judges are unaccountable. But... Those are legal opinions. Let's, let's look at a real world case. Let's look at what happened when I made my videos. Let's look at how the university responded. Because I can tell you, in the video I said, look, what I'm doing is probably illegal. And worse, my employer is legally responsible for it. Because that's built, in, that's built into the codes as well. So by the way, if you're an employer, you're responsible for everything that your employees say. And everything that in, anybody interprets what they said as being, whether it's unintentional or intentional, whether or not a complaint has been made. So just think about that. Anyways, October 3rd, the university said, like all members of the university community, I have an obligation to comply with the law, including the provisions of the Ontario Human Rights Code. Their policy with regards to workplace harassment, which the university implied that I was engaging in, engaging in a course of vexatious comment or conduct, where the course of comment or conduct is known, or ought reasonably be known, to be unwelcome. So what happened essentially was the university reviewed what I had done, and then they reviewed the policies as laid out on the Ontario Human Rights Commission website. The university reviewed my videos and they decided that what I said was true. They decided that the video I made was probably illegal and that they were responsible for it. And so in an attempt to distance themselves from me, under counsel from their legal people, and believe me, the university has good legal people, they sent me a warning. And this is what happens if you want to discipline a recalcitrant employee, essentially, so that you don't have to bear legal responsibility for their acts. And after the third warning, you can take further steps. Now, I pointed out to the university at one point when, when um, we were discussing how this 
form was going to proceed that perhaps it would be in their best interests to not support the people who were trying to stop me from talking but instead to support me legally and if necessary to take this all the way to the Supreme Court and the university said categorically that they would not do that so I would say when it comes to the contradictory provisions that are in the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and so we might say roughly equality versus freedom of speech the university decided which side they're going to go down on so on October 18th the university mentioned to me in another warning letter that if personal pronouns are being used the refusal to use the personal pronoun that is an expression of the person's gender identity can constitute discrimination. So now, you see what's happened is that I haven't refused to use someone's gendered, uh, gender neutral pronouns. I said that I would refuse. So it's not even the refusal itself that's producing the letters. It's my declared intent to engage in the refusal. And as far as I was concerned, what I was essentially doing was criticizing a piece of legislation that had not yet been passed. But the university's legal department decided that all that was sufficient for them to distance themselves from me and to engage in disciplinary activity. So, and then with regards to these human rights tribunals where all this stuff would be sorted out, it's like those places destroy your reputation and destroy you financially. And can they put you in jail? Well, it's a complicated argument in some sense, but I can tell you that if you refuse to pay the fines, that's the next step. The federal people have indicated that these policies will be interpreted, interpreted in accordance with the Ontario Human Rights Commission's policies online. And so you guys should go read those because those are not fun. And I would say that they pose an incredible threat to your liberty. And it's all done under the guise of compassion. People who keep pushing that on you are making a massive mistake. And they're infantilizing you. And they're terrifying people in the university community, as you can tell by the letter that I just read. And I really, I received dozens of letters like that. People are afraid to say anything because they're going to get targeted. And if you wonder or not if that's true, then just think about what happened to me. And ask yourself if it's true. Good enough. Thank you. As a Trinity College and OISE alumnus, I'm typically delighted to return to the University of Toronto. Today is different. To make sense of what it means to be here today, I found myself going back frequently to the 1989 debate at Western on the subject of race and IQ between Philip Rushton and David Suzuki. To borrow David Suzuki's opening words on that day, quote, I do not want to be here. I do not want to dignify this man and his ideas in public debate, end quote. There was, in 1989, at Western as now, an extraordinary media frenzy concerning the apparent threat to academic freedom posed by the mere possibility that academic freedom is not an absolute guarantee, that as scholars, our relationship with knowledge and with the public trust is tempered by responsibilities and limitations. Of crucial import to my argument today is that this is a relationship structured not on juridical grounds, this is not about the law, but on ethical grounds. The very real effects of the knowledge claims that we make as scholars require that our claims be subjected to rigorous critical scrutiny. And there is no set of knowledge claims more important to subject to critical scrutiny than statements that appear to perpetuate and to incite already existing forms of hatred, violence, and prejudice toward members of minority groups. We need to identify and address the claims made in the recent public works of Jordan Peterson. Claims about trans people, claims about the validity of gender identity, claims about the proper use of pronouns, and claims about academic freedom rights. And let's be clear, we have a unique difficulty here today in subjecting these claims to scholarly scrutiny. What kind of claims can you have in amateurish videos? The recent public works of Jordan Peterson provide a fabulous case study of the cultural production of true believers. The cultural production of ignorance in an age of reactionary populism. So let's take a look at how consequential and studied ignorance works in relation to gender. Here are the major claims of Dr. Peterson's recent public works, specifically the first of three lectures concerning Bill C-16. And I will quote directly here from my lecture transcript. 
Bill C-16 scares me, lectures Dr. Peterson. The Ontario Human Rights Commission is a particularly pathological organization. Social justice warrior types are overrepresented, and I can't help but think it's because our current premier is a lesbian, and the LGBT community has become extraordinarily good at organizing themselves and has a fairly pronounced and very, very sophisticated radical fringe. Gender identity and gender expression are not valid ideas. They're not true. There's no evidence for it. I don't know what the options are if you don't identify as a man or a woman. There's an idea that there's a gender spectrum. I think it's an ill-informed opinion, end quote. Rather than to address himself to the scientific evidence concerning gender identity and expression, and by adopting rhetorical strategies more common to BreitbartNews.com than a university professor's lecture, Dr. Peterson goes on to discredit the very constructs on political grounds instead of on grounds provided by scholarly evidence that these constructs are, in no particular order, leftist, radical, and politically correct. On the subject of pronouns and gender expression, Dr. Peterson is emphatic that, quote, I don't recognize another person's right to determine what pronouns I use to address them. I won't do it. For the vast majority of people, he goes on to say, gender identity and sexual orientation, and I guess he means sex, are the same thing, end quote. As for the definition of transgender, Dr. Peterson claims that, and I quote, I don't believe that they, these people, these terms stand for good things. I think that these people use these terms as a pretense that they stand for good things, as a pretext for them to continue their nefarious activities, end quote. Well, this is hardly the stuff of academic scholarship. I'm a member of the Global Education Initiative of the World Professional Association for Transgender Health. And I can tell you without a shred of doubt that there is no link between the public claims made by Professor Jordan Peterson about gender generally and transgender specifically and a body of easily accessible peer-reviewed scholarship. This body of peer-reviewed research knowledge provides conclusive evidence that whereas anatomical sex is perhaps dimorphically categorical, and that's only if we choose to ignore intersex, that secondary sex characteristics cannot be argued simplistically to be determined by chromosomal sex, and that there is highly significant diversity in gender identity and expression, which exists on a continuum that reveals persistent differences that cannot be explained by sex assigned at birth. Gender identity and expression are dynamic, biosocial aspects of human diversity that are culturally and socially in a complex relationship with matter. Gender identity and expression are linked both to the extraordinary plasticity of human life and the fluidity of identity, and as well, and this is where we must pay close attention, linked to gender-based violence, to minority stress, and threats to a whole host of rights in Canada that are not up for debate here today. These rights include the right to recognition, the right to communicability of presence, the right to culturally competent institutional climates, and perhaps the most profound of all rights, the right to safety and the right to culture and access to knowledge. Whereas almost all the media attention on the Jordan Peterson affair has focused on the possible threat to his academic freedom, I want to focus instead on the ethical significance of an academic's total dereliction of academic responsibility. Academics are never free to distribute totally bogus claims while trading on the value provided by their title as a professor in a great Canadian university and, perhaps even worse, as a clinician registered by an accreditation body. Quite the contrary. Every faculty member takes on academic responsibilities that embody an ethical commitment, which is precisely not responsibilities required by the law. 
academic knowledge that appears to codify knowledge about minority populations must not add to the harms already facing minority groups by itself contributing to the consolidation of ignorance nor by inciting hatred toward members of these groups. Faced with Philip Rushton's perpetuation of racist assumptions in his research on race and IQ in the 1989 debate, David Suzuki concludes that one can only infer, quote, he is either grossly ignorant or deliberately mischievous. Either way, what is required is action by scientists and academics. His claims must be denounced. This is not science, end quote. Surely, the deliberate production of ignorance concerning a precarious minority group constitutes evidence of the most unethical abnegation of the responsibility of academics to contribute to human well-being, collective intelligence, flourishing, and the survival of planetary life. The institution of the public university cannot and must not sanction ignorance. And most emphatically, we must denounce the deliberate cultural production of ignorance. We can and we must do better. And we must do better, not because it is prescribed by the law, but because we have an ethical commitment to contribute to the advancement of knowledge in a democratic society. Thank you. In law, we tend to distinguish between the law as it is and the laws we would like it to be. And the experts you cited seem to be critical of the law as it is, um, along with you. Um, but does Professor Kosman's outlining of some of the elements of C16 in particular, does that give you any comfort? Does it allay any of your concerns that it really focuses on the advocacy of genocide or the commission of hate crimes? And, that those kinds of things are probably the sort of restrictions that most people in the room would think were reasonable restrictions? No, I, I, it doesn't give me any comfort. Um, and the, the reason it doesn't give me any comfort is because as far as I've con I'm concerned, what this is actually about has already played itself out in my case, and I already explained, explained that to you. I would say a, a, a legal doctrine is something like a virus, and it has a life. If you, if That's you let not what we think. If you, if you let it go into a living system, it, it propagates and it has effects, and the effects are a consequence of the philosophy that's embedded inside the law. And if you really want to know about this, you should read Alexander Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago, because what he does in that book is tell you how the hypothetically humane doctrines that were embedded in radical Marxism at the end of the 1800s unfolded into Soviet society and demolished it. But I want to tell you a little bit about what the law does. And this is with regards to its uh, interpretation from the policy guidelines. It instantiates social constructionism into our legal system. You have to understand what that means. There's a huge debate about how human identity is, is, is um, upon what grounds human identity is predicated. Now, the radical social constructionists basically say that identity is nothing but a social construction, and that, that's in keeping with their philosophical doctrines, partly Marxist and partly, partly postmodern. But that isn't, and that was what I was objecting to with regards to Bill C-16, because it insists, do you understand this? It makes this legal doctrine that biological sex, gender identity, gender expression, and sexual orientation vary independently. And they don't. Now, the reason they don't is because 98% of people, it's 99.7% of people, by the way, at least with regards to the most credible statistics, have a gender identity that's essentially identical with their biological sex. And almost everybody who is male and female by biological sex and gender identity dresses that way, and that's what it, gender expression essentially is. And then if you stack those three things on top of each other, they're basically isomorphic. You can add sexual orientation to that, and 98% of people are heterosexual. So the idea that those things vary independently is absolutely preposterous. But it's written into the law, and that has terrible consequences. You see, I don't know, for example, now, to what degree any discussion in universities of the biological differences between men and women are legal. And you think, oh, well, that's an exaggeration. It's like, well, they, I debated Nicholas Matt, I believe that was his name, a professor at the University of Toronto on TVO's The Agenda, and he said right out for everyone to hear that 
the scientific consensus is that there's no biological differences between men and women and I've received letters from people who've told me that now the social justice activist types are complaining about the fact that the biologists assign biological sex to animals because it's only a social construct that we're projecting onto their being and um, you know, we just heard that the, cr the chromosomal level of analysis is complex it's not that complex, what we have is a bimodal distribution with a tiny number of exceptions, and that, by the way, is not a spectrum. I think you were just starting at the end of your, um, of your discussion in your answer to the last question to talk a little bit about uh, some of the points that Professor Bryson made about your, your picture of gender and, and um, the relationship between sex and gender and some of those issues. And, um, you know, she, she lays out some of the science and some of the actual scientific findings um, around, those, around those issues. And I wonder, when you, when you take a look at some of that research, does it imp how does it affect your, your thinking on some of these questions? About, is in particular, um, okay. what some people think of as perhaps a rather simplified picture of sex and gender. Okay. One of the things it builds in, for example, is the claim that identity is only subjectively defined. And that's built right in. It says that. Your identity is whatever you think it is. Well, let me tell you, as a practicing psychologist, that's absolute rubbish. Your identity, to, look, <laughs> When, when children are two years old, that's what they think. They think that their subjective reality is everything. And what you do is you socialize them between the ages of two and four to adopt uh, an identity that's part of a cultural negotiation. It's like your identity is part of a cultural negotiation. It's partly the game you play and partly the game that I play with you. And I have to be a voluntary participant in that. And not only, not only is it not subjectively defined, which detaches it entirely, by the way, from the underlying biological and the underlying objective reality, making any claim you want for your subjective identity valid. The other thing it does, it, it completely obliviates the idea that identity is actually a pra pragmatic entity, for God's sake. It's like if you're a lawyer or a father or a mother, like an identity that has some solidity to it. Your identity is also a vehicle within which you travel through life, right? It's a set of tools, a set of pragmatic tools that you use to interact with the social and the natural world. It's not only your subjective whim. The idea of gender identity, which is only defined subjectively in the relevant law, has been studied intensively by personality psychologists such as myself. In fact, my lab has done some of the, I wouldn't say the most fundamental research on it, but, you know, we're in the, ball and we're in the ballpark. Here's a little story. Okay, so... The, the differences between personality between men and women are basically what constitutes gender identity in, insofar as it's not merely subjective. And one of the things that's happened is that as the Scandinavian countries have equalized their political and sociological landscape, the differences in identity between men and women have got larger, not smaller. Do you understand that? That's a refutation of the social constructionist claim. So what happens is that if you flatten out the landscape so that there are very few socioeconomic differences, say, or sociological differences in the treatment between men and women, what happens is the biological difference maximizes. It maximizes. Do you understand? That means men and women get more different, not more the same. And the thing about women in the audience, bloody hell, you should think about this because don't you want to pursue the things that you're interested in? And if you pursue the things that you're interested in, because you're interested in different things than men, I'm telling you. And if you look at the interest, if you look at the interest variation, this has been established technically. If you look at the interest variation, there's almost no overlap between men and women. If you sum up the differences in so inter interest and temperament, <laughs> okay. <laughs> You know, what, what does some of the evidence, what does some of the, um, what are sort of the objective realities in this situation that we might hold on to? Science about causality, about in essence sex being linked and producing gender requires us to move outside of the current realm. All that we have in this realm is quasi-experimentation. We can't actually do studies where we manipulate the chromosomal or the hormonal environment and so since we can't remove sexism and misogyny from the production of gender, we can't actually reach conclusions about what we take to be gender differences. Thank Point you. two, pronouns. Let's put pronouns in some kind of context. And I think it's really helpful in going back to what Justice uh, Minister Wilson Raybould said yesterday following the passing of C-16, and I'll quote, 
It's our collective responsibility to recognize and reduce the vulnerability of transgender diverse persons to discrimination, hate crimes, and hate propaganda. And a lot of what we've been hearing here is hate propaganda. So what I want to say about pronouns is that we have to get beyond this simplistic discussion, which is either about grammatical infelicity, singular, plural, or that we should be nice to people. We actually have to deal with our responsibility in creating institutional climates that take very seriously the goal of reducing inequality. That has always been the fundamental goal of education. So at the University of British Columbia, the Trans Two-Spirit and Gender Diversity Task Force is looking at everything in the context of what Greta Bauer and her amazing colleagues at TransPulse call institutional and informational erasure. We are looking at housing, student health. How are trans and gender diverse students going to go to student health and get care that is both medically and culturally competent? How should we be organizing student information systems so that people can tell us their names and their pronouns? This is a technical challenge only, and we have to rise to the challenge. Uh, Professor Peterson, let's start with you. Uh, so this question says, um, you present your issue with Bill C-16 to be that the infringement of freedom of expression regarding gender pronouns is a problem. Do you hold the same stance with other discriminatory language in the Human Rights Code, such as being able to use uh, racist uh, terms uh, with regard to students? And if you believe that one of these things is a violation but not the other one, why? I'm not sure I read that okay. out all that yeah. well, but yeah. you get the idea. Okay, well, well first of all, I don't think that these issues are the same. I don't think they're the same at all. I mean, I've think, been thinking about the pronoun thing, you know, because one of the things that people, it put me back on my heels for a while because the claim was basically, well, it's something like, why doesn't the mean professor just play nice and, and respect people by using their pronouns? And it took me like three weeks to unpack that because who gets questioned about pronoun use? I don't know why the hell I use the pronouns I use. I use them because they're part of the language. I use he and she because that's what everyone uses. And so then I had to think about, well, why, why do we, in fact, use pronouns? And we use them in part for the same reason that we use other categories, and that's to simplify the world for functional purposes, roughly speaking. But then I was thinking, well, is the use of he and she a mark of respect? And the answer to that is, well, no, it's not a mark of respect. It can't be a mark of respect. What you call four billion people can't be a mark of respect, right? It's a, it's a mark of basic categorization. And so then the claim comes up, well, if someone wants you to use a particular pronoun, then you're disrespecting them if you don't. It's like, hmm, okay, let's think that through a bit. Well, that assumes that when I'm using he or she for, for people in, you know, in normal parlance, that I'm actually indicating my respect for them. And that's not true. It's like, if I don't know you, I class classify you generically, and basically I classify you in terms of how you present yourself publicly. I suppose that's your gender expression. And then I nail you with whatever pronoun seems to fit. It has nothing to do with respect. And besides that, you bloody well don't get to demand my respect. Why should you? You know, I mean, it's not like I respect everyone. That's a foolish thing to do. You respect people who are respectable. You know, you, you make value distinctions between people, and that doesn't mean you illegally discriminate against them. Those aren't the same thing. But I'm all for value judgments. Don't tell me that I'm not respecting people when I don't use their gendered pronouns. And the other thing is, I don't buy this whole idea that the people who are putting this legislation forward are valid representatives of the trans community. That's what they say they are. We have mechanisms for deciding whether someone's a valid representative of a community, and that generally involves democratic voting. I've received at least 20 letters from transsexual people who are on my side, and by the way, zero from others, believe it or not, who are perfectly happy with the idea of gendered pronouns. It's just they want to be the other one. Now, you can have a discussion about that, and there's lots of things to be said about it, but the idea that this community that's coming out and these, demanding these rights is somehow representative of this homogenous, oppressed minority, I think is rubbish. For this question, I'm going to ask uh, both uh, Professor Kosman and Professor Bryson uh, to comment on it. Um, so one of the objectives of the transgender and queer rights movement is to enter into public conscience um, in a way. And this uh, person asks, uh, this can only occur through public conversation. 
Uh, do you worry that it's, it may uh, not be possible to have thoughtful discussion if there is government restriction about uh, this kind of speech? And do you worry that it would skew discuss, discussion in one uh, direction or another? Uh, so perhaps uh, Professor Kosman first, and then Professor Bryson. I think that there is an important way to have public discussions um, around a whole range of issues. I would welcome a discussion on the role of hate speech provisions. I would welcome a discussion around the role of hate speech and its desirability um, about whether the Supreme Court of Canada is right or not right in upholding its constitutionality. But I would like to have that debate with someone who is knowledgeable about the law. Thank you. And Professor Bryson. One of the big questions that I had to deal with in considering whether or not to accept the very generous offer, uh, invitation of the University of Toronto to come here today would be the impact of this event on trans and gender non-binary people, uh, specifically at the University of Toronto and much more generally. And so, Whereas I would say that I recognize practices of peer review, and practices of peer review are not denouncement. Practices of peer review are practices that we utilize to make assessments about knowledge claims. Whereas I would fully appreciate being able to enter into a discussion about gender and gender identity and issues around trans culture as a means of practicing peer review, I think the difficulty that we've had, and we've managed to reproduce this difficulty here today, uh, characterized just now by Dr. Peterson as simplifying the world for functional purposes. Simplifying the world for functional purposes is not what I recognize to be academic practice. This is not how we relate to knowledge. And so I think that there's a concern when we don't subject claims that are being made as knowledge claims by people who carry titles at great Canadian universities, when we don't treat those knowledge claims in the same way that we would in any other field. And when they're knowledge claims made about members of minority groups, embattled, vulnerable, marginalized members of minority groups, then I think that we all need to be very concerned about how it is that we're changing what we think we do in the university, which is supposed to be about the advancement of knowledge and excellence. Thank you. <laughs> is Professor Peterson, sorry, um, as a clinical psychologist, refusing to acknowledge how damaging it could potentially be to an individual to disregard their identity? I, it's a very difficult question to even engage with because I don't understand it's, I don't understand it. It makes things so simple that you can't discuss them properly. All I do in my clinical practice, and I have about 20,000 hours of experience with clinical, in my clinical practice, and I've dealt with all sorts of people, far more variation in people than the typical person ever encounters, and I think I've done it at least reasonably, competently. All my discussions with people in my clinical practice are about their identity, given the definition of identity that I brought forth, how they feel about themselves, how they conceptualize themselves, because those are two different things, how that plays out in their interactions with other people, and what the functional significance of that is. And I'm, I'm going to say forthrightly, well, two things. One is that I don't believe that any of my clients have had cause to worry about my interpretation of their identity because what I do in my practice is help them discover what that is. I'm really, I'm seriously not interested in imposing any ideas of identity onto someone because I don't, I can't do that. I don't know what the right vehicle is for you to travel through life. What I can help you do is articulate your concerns. I can ask you questions where I see contradictions in your self-articulation. I can help you make plans for the future. And I've helped thousands and thousands and thousands of people, by the way, make plans for the future with the stuff that I do online. And so I'm helping people build a genuine identity. Um, well, and that's what I do. So. That's the answer to that question, and, and I think I do it well. I mean, in, in the stuff we've done from a research perspective with the Future Authoring Program, which I offered to people free a week and a half ago to help them catalyze their identities, we've helped 5,000 university students increase their grade point average 20% and decrease their dropout by the same. And the biggest effect has been with men and 
and non-Western ethnic minority students who've accelerated their performance up beyond the range of the normal for the, for the dominant culture. A pure psychological intervention, I might say, and not a sociological intervention. So I'm perfectly willing to stack my record on identity formulation up against anyone's. And, and, so, and I should also point out that I think where I'm most vulnerable in this entire debate, and I expect this will happen, and you know it, there's already been noise about it on the Ontario Psychological Association website, I think they'll, that they'll probably come after my clinical license. So that, that'd, be my, that'd be my guess. So, so I think we might be straying a little away from yeah, the question well, now. So uh, just uh, thank you. Um, so, um, no, we're not, because that, that, question, that question involved my clinical practice. I'm not straying a bit. That involved my clinical practice. And there was a reason that the question was posed. So I'm not straying. Thank you. Why do you feel that someone's personal gender identity and pronouns infringes your free speech? Can one not also argue based on your interpretation that professors can use racial slurs in their classroom um, and the, that the inability to do so would violate their freedom of speech? Well, that's pretty much the same question, I think. Um, I think that we're crossing a dangerous line. And the line is the requirement that's being put upon people by government agencies with the full force of the law behind them to decide what language categories you're going to use. When I opened this debate, this forum, um, I tried to explain what this is about. And I couldn't explain everything that it's about because it's about too many things. But one of the things it's about is ideology and the distinction between the left and the right. And let's say, now, I truly believe that these made-up pronouns of which there are many, dozens in fact, and there's no consensus on them. I was just going to ask if you could go back to the point about the analogy uh, between uh, the racial slur and the and the. I don't pronoun. think there's any analogy at all. But that's I think what the difference people between, want to hear I'm want. talking about compelled speech. There's a difference between saying that there's something you can't say and saying that there are things that you have to say. And I regard these made up pronouns, all of them, as the neologisms of radical PC authoritarians. Do you understand that? And I don't, I'm not a fan of that sort of person. And the reason I'm not a fan of that sort of person is because I've done my homework. I've read everything I can get my hands on in the development of authoritarian political systems and I know the literature inside out and backwards. And I am not going to be a mouthpiece for language that I detest. And that's that. But from your perspective as someone who's also had a senior leadership role, as well as being an expert in the area, do you have any thoughts or guidance about what universities can do uh, to ensure that we're moving things forward in a helpful, inclusive way? Let's talk about apologies. So this week, we heard from uh, Justin Trudeau's government about the apology that would be made to LGBTQ Canadians concerning uh, the extraordinarily violent impacts of discriminatory activities that were also research activities happening uh, at Canadian universities and elsewhere to locate and to fire LGB Canadians from the public service and from the RCMP. And let's pay attention to some of the details of that situation. You can Google the fruit machine, an incredibly bogus apparatus that was created, let's say not coincidentally, by a psychologist at Carleton University, Dr. Wake, who was the chair of the psychology department, intended only to identify uh, supposed homosexuals who then would be fired from government service and from the RCMP. If we fast forward to the fairly recent past, we could look at Cam H making an apology for the incredibly damaging work carried out by Zucker in his bogus conversion therapy based entirely on these ideas about sex producing gender constancy, which then in the case of gender diverse young people could be cured by means of conversion therapy. Cam H had to apologize to the Canadian public and to Ontarians 
for the harms carried out by Dr. Zucker. And so I think that we might need to think about two things at the University of Toronto. And one would be an apology for any uh, damages to the right to safety and the right to humanity on the part of trans and gender diverse people at the university and in the great city of Toronto more generally. And then, of course, the University of Toronto also, and perhaps it already is, and I'm sure you know more about this than I do, could implement the kind of wide-ranging program to think very carefully about how in an intelligent way to accommodate gender diversity and trans people in this wonderful, great Canadian university that is the University of Toronto. Thank you.